Thank you, Fritz, and uh, to the class of 2023, congratulations. Um, I, I am I'm really honored and humbled and uh, super excited to be sharing this special day with you. As Fritz said, tomorrow is Mother's Day, so let me also give a shout out uh, to the parents in the house, since, <laughs> right, <clears throat> since you graduates would not be here without them. Um, and as a parent myself, I know the occasion stirs up a mix of joy and uh, relief, anticipation, and a few butterflies. Um, I owe to my own parents many things, uh, including the incredible privilege of having grown up in Greenwich Village, a neighborhood that uh, back then was not the swanky refuge for movie stars and, and hedge fund billionaires it is now, but a filthy, rundown, laid back, 24 seven, insufferably smug enclave for a diversity of working and middle class New Yorkers social outcasts, free thinkers, the Genovese crime family. It was, it was a tourist mecca and very proud historic LGBTQ uh, sanctuary, but to locals, a small town inside a big city and a template for what became uh, ground up urbanism. For a city kid who knew next to nothing about suburbia, the dense urbanist virtues of the low and medium rise village with its backyards, intimate spaghetti entanglements of streets and mom and pop stores. They were so ingrained in me and seemed so self-evident that I was dumbfounded when as a teenager, I first read The Death and Life of Great American Cities by my neighbor, Jane Jacobs, because I couldn't imagine anyone thought otherwise. Looking back, we can see that Jacobs was not right about everything, that among other things, she could not anticipate how, say, certain middle-class tower-in-the-park developments would evolve into desirable places to live in dense urban neighborhoods. I'm thinking of projects in New York like Penn South and Silver Towers. And we can also see that her libertarianism was the luxury of an urban economy in decline and now runs up against an unprecedented income gap and affordable housing shortage in the United States. What I came to learn from Jacobs, whom I got to know and, and corresponded with in her later years, it was a great privilege, was actually something different than the virtues of sidewalk ballets and eyes on the street. It was the power of communicating clearly, directly, forcefully, humanely with a wide public. Death and Life talks to generations of young people more than 60 years after it was published because it dissects in evergreen and undeniable detail how urban neighborhoods work at the level of the curb and the sidewalk. And it does so in a language that is no less down to earth and grounded. The strength of Jacobs's voice in that book was that she was not speaking as if from an ivory tower or from 30,000 feet in the vein of Robert Moses and other mid-century planners who seemed to look down on the people whose neighborhoods they were demolishing in the name of urban renewal. I mention this because I believe there's a crucial lesson here for you on the threshold of your professional lives. Your ability to express independent ideas clearly, directly, and humanely, as opposed to cloaking them in mumbo jumbo architectural theories or marketing strategies or art world jargon, will I think be a great boon to your success because you will need to persuade skeptics and critics and win allies to the architects, planners, designers, preservationists among you. Your potential partners and opponents alike will only be more inclined to listen to you if you speak as Jacobs does in that book in plain, transparent, and practical terms from the heart with respect for your audience, giving them some vision of hope. Jacobs doesn't just rage against the failures of the planning and architectural establishment, after all. She offers an alternative view, a path toward progress. That's what you will need to offer your clients and the wider public. Not platitudes, abstractions, empty promises and formulas, but tangible, visceral progress or some vision of it. 
I'm grateful to my parents on that score too because I grew up in a household that believed in the larger inexorable forces of history moving toward a better world. My mother was a sculptor, my father a proud UPenn graduate and native Philadelphian who became an eye surgeon and devout Marxist. My mother helped organize Women's Strike for Peace. My father helped found the anti-nuclear Physicians for Social Responsibility, and he traveled with the Freedom Riders to Mississippi, tending to the injured. Our apartment was a revolving door for civil rights leaders, lefty authors and lawyers, and freeloading Communist Party apparatchiks horning in on my family dinners. My father shared with them a beautiful but delusional respect for Soviet projects like universal health care, equal rights, and the universal right to housing, which early on I came to realize were noble causes, but not reality for most Russians living under Moscow's thumb. My father didn't see through the Soviet propaganda because he didn't trust US authorities after the McCarthy era, because they had gotten us in, and because they had gotten us into the Vietnam War and were sicking dogs and police on civil rights protesters. He scoured the pages of the New York Times, obsessively circling and cutting out articles because he was convinced that the paper was run by the CIA. So if he read it closely enough, he might uncover plots to take over the world by America's military industrial complex. He was a scientist and chess champion, a man steeped in complex knowledge and facts, a person of enormous wit and warmth, a beloved doctor, who risked his life to fight for racial injustice. But he was a dreamer and an ideologue. So I deeply admired his desire to do good, his skills at organizing people and his bravery. But I became skeptical of globalizing theories and pie in the sky ideologues. At the same time that I gathered from his obsession with publications like the Times, that engaging, engaging a wide public mattered that it was a critical, exciting, potentially moral undertaking. I realized the public realm, whether we mean shared physical public spaces we design and build, or the pages of a newspaper or website we write and share, public realm is where we get to thrash out our democracy and our collective identity, where we negotiate who and what we are as a society and a polis. It's where we construct, question, our gendered patriarchal shibboleths, building by building, plaza by plaza, street by street, one picture, garden and mural at a time. Incrementally, in other words. You are probably familiar with Jaime Lerner's phrase, urban acupuncture, which in practice can be as instrumental as large-scale massive interventions. Partly in reaction, I think, to my parents' totalizing views, I came to realize that progress involves slow, step-by-step, -step, messy, sometimes elusive processes that are more frustrating and complicated than just backing one regime or political party or another, or speechifying about abuses of authority and other social ills. That may be why journalism attracted to me, because like your work, it atomizes the world into discrete problems recognizing progress as transactional, granular, but more than that, it accepts that what can seem like progress at one moment often turns out to be problematic later on. So there is no end to the pursuit of progress. Progress is a lifelong pursuit, not a gig. I am here to suggest that you lean into this open-ended, circuitous notion of progress in your careers. I was a pianist growing up, then as an undergraduate at Yale, gravitated from music to history because I didn't want to narrow my world yet, and I thought history would help me lay a foundation for understanding how we got here. I realized other people would try to limit my scope and my thinking. That's how the professional world operates. So I wanted to resist for as long as possible. Still unsure whether to pursue piano or academics, after graduation, by sheer dumb luck, I landed a job as an editor at a design trade journal called ID Magazine, which later became a chic publication, but back then was so terrible that it was willing to hire a total know-nothing like me. It changed my life. When I started on my doctoral studies at Harvard in art and architectural history, I moonlighted writing journalism 
I became the architecture critic for New England Monthly and did a few music reviews for the Boston Globe, which barely paid my subway fare, but made me feel I was still participating in a wider public conversation. And so when, out of the blue, I was offered a job as a music critic for a newspaper in Atlanta, then here in Philadelphia, then for the New York Times, I left my dissertation unfinished. After the Times discovered I was trained in art history, the editors made me the paper's chief art critic, a job for which I was spectacularly unprepared, and I spent several terrified years just trying not to make a complete idiot of myself in public. Once I finally got a handle on that job, I started feeling restless and guilty, not unhappy with art or artists, but increasingly feeling a personal responsibility and urged to do work that was meaningful to a wider public than I felt I was reaching, and that grappled in whatever small ways I could with the big challenges of the day, like the environment and the state of our cities and social welfare, while, I hoped, retaining something of the transformative and creative ambitions of art. In essence, I wanted to focus on the kind of work you all here will do. I hope you see where I'm going with this. You will need to come to terms with the limits of your own agency to grapple with problems larger than yourself, which by profession, I believe you are now ideally, historically suited to address. The architects, planners, urban designers, landscape architects, historic preservationists, and data technologists, not to mention some of the artists among you, your work will try to enhance and reimagine the built environment, which includes flora and fauna. Let me remind you of an observation by the late Harry Cobb, architect of the John Hancock Tower, a longtime GSD professor and partner of IM Pei. Architecture is caught in a conflict, Harry wrote. On the one hand, it is impossible for architecture to ignore the ethical obligation stemming from the fact that buildings are intended to be useful. On the other hand, it is fatal for architecture to be trapped in the condition of being merely useful. From the ethical perspective, architecture is contaminated by its art status, while from the architectural perspective, it is contaminated by its use status. Yet this is precisely what makes our art so important in culture, writes Harry. Every work of architecture is inescapably enmeshed in the systems of power and standards of ethical conduct from which its art status demands with equal insistence that it be liberated. The reconciliation of these seemingly irreconcilable demands precisely defines the ultimate task of the architect. I mostly agree with Harry, and for you embarking on your careers, the even tougher question is, how will you keep your moral compass and remember your goals when faced with all the mundane technical chores and professional compromises that may well define these early next taxing years? I think the answer is to let the process be your guide. I droned on about my own background, my old neighborhood, my family, and my meandering career path because I wanted to make the point that a professional life, it is, if it is to grow and remain interesting, must be iterative and additive. It does not need to follow a straight line. It requires your remaining open to change, questioning your routines and choices, assumptions and beliefs, leaving comfort zones and putting yourself in unfamiliar situations. All that sounds like commencement speech boilerplate, I know. But, Life is not a game of musical chairs in which you lose out if you can't settle into your seat quickly enough. It is, like progress itself, always in need of reassessment. Fritz mentioned the Industrial Revolution, the ultimate example of human progress, which ushered in the steam engine, incandescent lighting, telecommunications, modern transportation and infrastructure, modern cities, the elimination of countless diseases, the decline of infant mortality, extreme poverty, starvation and illiteracy, the mass distribution of food and water, medicine, education, the proliferation of the middle class. But today, we also take pains to note that it industrialized the exploitation of labor, 
weaponized colonial expansion and inaugurated the Keeling Curve and the Anthropocene era. Let me give you an example less grandiose and closer to home, the High Line in New York City. As you all know, the High Line is a recuperated industrial railway viaduct in Manhattan, reimagined by UPenn superstars, James Corner and Lisa Switkin, and also by a couple of architects, non-Penn faculty members whose names I can't remember at the moment. <laughs> We talk about the High Line the way we do about Geary's Guggenheim and Bilbao as one of those world-shaking 21st century architectural game changers whose success every other city wants to copy. And in many ways, the High Line is a spectacular achievement. It is a model of adaptive reuse, of exquisite contextual design, an exalting, unspooling public space and lofty pedestrian path akin to the wooden walkway spanning the Brooklyn Bridge, a garden and public street in air, suspended just above the traffic and the noise, below the flight of birds in a kind of middle zone that suddenly lets visitors experience the city from an entirely unfamiliar perspective. It became, not surprisingly, an instant tourist attraction and real estate bonanza, bringing in hundreds of millions of dollars to city coffers. Its success highlights the role community leaders play, because the park as we now know it was the brainchild of two Chelsea residents, Robbie Hammond and Josh David, who had the fortitude and resourcefulness to enlist James Corner Field Operations and Diller Scafidio Renfro to raise the money and the political capital needed as well. They wouldn't have been able to do any of that without the foresight of planners working for the Regional Plan Association, who in 1999 issued a crucial visionary report arguing that the derelict viaduct should, re should be repurposed at a time when Mayor Giuliani and other powerful people in New York were desperate to tear it down. So the High Line exemplifies how the most transformative public works are collective undertakings. But that's not the end of the story because the High Line also brought about changes its founders never intended. It turned an industrial neighborhood in decline into a global poster child for runaway gentrification. Hammond and David had envisioned the linear park serving 5,000 mostly black and brown public housing residents who lived next to the viaduct. They held dozens of community meetings in the housing projects. But when the park opened, the project's residents did not feel welcome and stayed away in droves Hammond, who came to run the High Line, considered this a major failure. So High Line officials went back to the public housing residents and asked what went wrong and how the park could fix the problem. It turned out that High Line officials weren't listening to the residents during those meetings, to what they really wanted in the park. Now public housing residents are coming in much greater numbers and the diversity of the park's visitorship has improved markedly. High Line officials also formed the High Line Network to advise other cities undertaking similar projects about how to offset unwanted gentrification and promote more equitable development. The results have been mixed, but among the plans to have emerged is the 11th Street Bridge project in Washington by OMA and Olin, another pen link, which connects the DC Navy Yard to the historically black neighborhood of Anacostia. People in charge of the bridge, whose construction has still not started, have been spending years collaborating with community members in Anacostia about bridge-related jobs, forming a community land trust, creating legal protections for renters and local businesses, and designing the bridge itself to respond to the desires of people living on the Anacostia side. This is how progress works. I know Penn is a place dedicated to the sort of public welfare and public service the 11th Street Bridge Project aspires to. The very first article I wrote as the Times architecture critic was about a complex and economically innovative subsidized housing project in the South Bronx by Grimshaw and Datner that was developed by Jonathan Rose, a Penn graduate and classmate of Dean Steiner, who was a student of Ian McCarg, founder of the landscape architecture department here. 
Some of the most inspired public spaces I, I've had the privilege to write about were designed by Penn icons. Marion Weiss and Michael Manfredi's Hunters Point South Waterfront Park in Queens, and Louis Kahn's belated Four Freedoms Park, which nearly half a century after it was conceived has made the long deserted southern tip of Roosevelt Island in New York into a new American landmark of reverent and majestic poetry. And recently, I've been consulting with Penn's Dennis Culhane about housing and homelessness issues, and with Matthias Bau about climate issues and the East Coast Resiliency Project in Lower Manhattan, devised in response to Hurricane Sandy. In that case, the reconstruction of a bedraggled Moses era park built on landfill in the East River to make the park into a barrier against rising seas that can protect vulnerable public housing residents. <laughs> That new park has divided along racial and class lines a neighborhood the park plan was intended to bring together. I say that because I want to reiterate, nothing you, you will do is easy. Your work is painstaking. The pay probably sucks. Professional dividends have to come from contributing to something bigger, more significant, and longer lasting than yourself as all these public projects, I think, have tried to do. Last week, the World Health Organization declared the end of the COVID-19 global health emergency. So, you are graduating at a moment of cultural polarization, trauma, and fear, but also hope and reflection. Among the lessons we learned from the pandemic was the profound and central significance of your work. Isolated in our houses and apartments, millions of people who may have previously taken for granted the fabric of the cities and neighborhoods they occupied suddenly recognized the power of public spaces and yearned to be able to come together again in the parks and streets and squares and shops and bars and galleries and museums and restaurants and concert halls and schools that collectively represent what we call home the built world. Togetherness, we realized, is the essential civic building block of the cosmopolis that forms the basis of a healthy modern society and a deliberative democracy. Neither a healthy society nor our democracy is guaranteed, we have come to realize in recent years. Both depend on vigilance, the building of alliances, and an endless process of equitable and incremental change in which we each get to do our part and in so doing, help others do theirs. Godspeed, class of 2023, and congratulations. <laughs>